most of what I do is online stuff. I started off tutoring the LSAT. I actually never thought I'd be doing that because back when I started studying for the LSAT in 2005, I thought I was smart, thought I was gonna go to a top 14, and then I got a 152 on my practice test. And so I thought, that's done. But I got obsessed with it. Like there's, at that point, there were like 40 something released exams. And so I just thought, well, I'll do all of those and learn what I need to know. And of course, it's not a good idea to just go through exam after exam. Like you have to analyze things. And that's what I came to learn over time is that I had to analyze the patterns in my mistakes, everything I got wrong, everything I had difficulty with, and very gradually over the course of an entire year, I brought my score up to a 175. And at that point, friends and friends of friends started asking me, how do I prep for this? What should I do? And so I'd sit down and I'd do like a study session with them. I'd go over a few problems and it helped them. And so I thought, well, I could charge for this. So I'd been tutoring other things in the past, like the SATs, the ACT in New York State, we have the Regents exams. And so I would tutor those and I thought, I'll just tutor the LSAT also. And because it's so much more niche than anything else, that became my focus. And I also loved it. It's much more complex than the GMAT or the GRE. I don't know if you've ever looked at either of those, but they're a lot easier. Even if you don't like math, the math is like what you learned in high school. The LSAT is something else altogether. And so I went pretty deep down the rabbit hole and I loved it. And once I graduated college, I wanted to do this full time. So I thought, I'll just keep tutoring. I should make a website to market myself. And so I did that. It's the LSAT blog, it's still the same website. And I've been running that for 10 years now. And so I started posting articles first like once a week and then three times a week and then every day. And then I had like a thousand articles and no one's gonna read that many. So I slowed down on that, but with the rise of the internet and video and podcast, that's been my new focus. And so my primary focus is honestly just putting out free stuff on every aspect of prep from logic games, logical reasoning, reading comp, test day prep, test day anxiety, uh, scheduling. Actually, one of the most popular things I have on my site are the day-by-day -day LSAT study plans. I have free week-by-week -week ones, but I've got to pay the bills, so I charge for the day-by-day -day ones. They're 20 to $25, depending on which one you get, and they cover periods of study from as short as one month all the way up to seven months. And I recommend a minimum of three to five months, but if you've got less time than that, I've got you covered with the one and two month schedules. Those are the most popular thing I offer. One other cool thing about my site is the LSAT diaries. I've had many students write in over the years just documenting their journeys. And so you can read their stories. You can see the stories of someone who went from a 141 to a 168 or a 160 to a 170. Wherever your starting point is, you can follow the journey of someone who progressed along the way and see their ultimate outcome. And so yeah, this is what I do. I do have online courses, I charge for them. Uh, the lowest cost one is 279. And so if you're looking for something more affordable, that could be a good option. Of course, there are many more benefits to the in-person class, but that's not always an option. So if you need the online, it is available to you. I do a small amount of one-on-one -on -one coaching. I work with a limited number of students, typically three to five for each LSAT administration. You can start with the self-study and then take it from there. You can start with a day-by-day -day plan for 20 bucks. If that's not enough, then you can consider adding on more resources. But I thought to myself, there's got to be something for everyone along the spectrum. So I've got the free stuff, the study schedules that are 20 to 25, then the course is a couple hundred bucks, and then the one-on-one, -on -one, which is obviously much more than that. But I try to have something for everybody, and I have a lot of fun with this. On the YouTube and the podcast, I'm interviewing law school admissions people, other LSAT instructors, sharing my own tips. Most of the videos are pretty short, but I try to have some interviews that are like 20 to 30 minutes. And so check them out and let me know what you think. If you uh, send me an email with a screenshot of your subscription to either the YouTube or the podcast, I'll send you an LSAT checklist for free. If you subscribe to both, I'll send you two checklists covering different parts of the exam. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I do. I love it, been doing it now for 13 years and no plans to stop. It's somewhat easy to measure your progress because you can take a diagnostic test. You can do a timed five section exam under realistic conditions and see where you stand. And if your goal is not that and you want five points more or 10 points more, then there's more work to do. You can do more timed exams. You can review in depth. You can maybe change your approach. So if you've just been studying with free stuff or browsing forums and you need something more structured or you need a course and you haven't done those things yet, you can consider doing those things. 
I think a lot of the courses are two to three months because that's what's economical to offer. You know, you couldn't offer a 500 hour LSAT course or the cost would be a lot higher, I presume. So there's a reality built in in terms of what LSAT companies are able to offer and what students are reasonably able to commit to. But sometimes it takes longer than you think it will. You know, LSAT retaking is more common than ever, especially since law schools don't average multiple LSAT scores. There's always incentive to retake if you think you can do better. But you know, three to five months is what I see most students typically needing in order to reach their fullest potential. And it's worth it. I mean, the LSAT trumps even the GPA. And so if retaking could get you a few more points, get you some more scholarship money. I've heard from admissions people that even just a single point more can make the difference between a yes and a no, or between getting another five or $10,000 a year. So the ROI on that is huge. It's worth putting in the time. You know, I wouldn't treat this as an afterthought. I would take it as seriously as at least a four credit class in college. There's plenty of spreadsheets if you wanna just analyze, you can input your results and see which question types you have particular trouble with. So anal analysis of that sort isn't too complicated, but I think there's also another level to it, which is, Maybe it's not about the question type, maybe it's about the method of reasoning and the stimulus. And so in that case, you might look to explanations or you might just look to deepen your own review process. I think a lot of students, they'll jump from method to method. I mean, there's so many out there. There's probably 12 to 15 major prep companies out there. They all have different terminology. They're all describing it in a slightly different way. And you don't wanna jump between all of them and become a jack of all trades, master of none sort of thing. Okay, sometimes it makes sense to focus on one and give it a try for a bit. Maybe it takes a couple of timed exams or a couple of weeks before something starts to click or stick with your practice methodology. I think most students don't do enough when it comes to reviewing in depth. It's too easy to look for that quick feedback. It's like a dopamine hit when you see your results and people can't even wait till the end of the exam. They're checking section by section. I know you guys do it because I do it too and that's fine, but it's more valuable to delay gratification a bit wait till the end of the exam so you're more closely mirroring your actual experience. And then with your review process, review not only everything you get wrong, but everything you have difficulty with. Students always say to me, I always get down to two and I pick the wrong one. Does that happen to you? I mean, it happens, right? But the thing is that you're also getting it right sometimes, but you're not paying attention to those instances because you got it right. You just move on. But anything you have trouble with, it could have easily just as have gone the other way next time. So what you want to do is, save a file, I agree, setting them aside is really good, and returning to them again and again. You could do them 10, 15 times. You could you know, photocopy or reprint multiple copies of these questions to do them clean, but the review process is the value in doing a time section or exam. It's not about just doing the questions and seeing your results. You're not looking to evaluate yourself. You're looking to improve your understanding. So you want to ask yourself, was it something in the stimulus the question stem or the answer choices. Let's say we're talking logical reasoning, right? So if it's the stimulus, you obviously have to evaluate that evidence, conclusion, subconclusion, counter premises, whatever it may be. Question stem, big things that give students trouble like necessary versus sufficient assumptions, which we can get into later, but there's also the answer choices. And for the answer choices, I think that's the toughest part of all because a lot of students will confidently choose the most tempting wrong answer, move on, and they don't have a good sense of where they actually stand. Turns out you confidently chose it wrong. I'm friends with a former writer of actual LSAT questions, and I was chatting him re with him recently, and he was talk talking all about the patterns in how they make wrong answer choices tempting. They're very clever, devious people. And so, for example, the right answer to the wrong, tempting wrong answer to a necessary assumption question will often be a sufficient assumption question, a su sufficient assumption answer choice, because it sounds tempting and strong. People like it. But what you want to do is figure out what was tempting about a wrong answer choice that made me pick it and what ultimately, what ultimately made it wrong. And what was discouraging about the right answer choice that pushed you away from it and what ultimately makes it correct. And you want to do it again and again and again so that you're spotting the patterns in your mistakes. It's like there's a thousand tricks the test makers might use and you're not falling for all thousand or else you'd be getting a 120, which presumably you're not. And even if you are, that's okay. You can start from there and work up. But Maybe you're getting 50, you're falling for 50 tricks out of a thousand or a hundred tricks out of a thousand and that's fine. You just gotta figure out the patterns in your mistakes. And some items don't come up that frequently. It's like maybe one trick comes up every five exams or every 10 exams. You gotta do that many exams to spot the patterns. But I think that analysis is really where the gains come from.